Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Alexey Fedosev, and uh, here at Cyanet, we get quite a lot of questions about uh, people coding in R and how to make it more efficient. So very often we're given the script uh, and the person just says something doesn't work. I think it's supposed to scale very well across multiple nodes, but it doesn't. What's going on? So um, we became quite good at identifying the problems and making codes run faster. So I want to share with you today some of the tips and tricks how you can do the same thing uh, yourself. So first of all, of course, um, since you're here, you're probably familiar with R a little bit. And you know that R is an interpreted language. We all know that interpreted languages like R, Python, Bash, they are not the most, the fastest languages uh, available. If you are after raw speed and high performance, then you surely should be looking in uh, coding in C or Fortran. But we all love R for its syntax, its simplicity, and additional packages that are available um, for it. So that's why uh, I personally like to keep my code in R. And then if I see some kind of a bottleneck, then I will be using techniques to improve the performance of this particular part of my code. So this is the goal of our session today, how you can uh, speed up your R. Well, first of all, as a general overview, uh, I'd like to mention that R uses pass by uh, value function arguments. It means that it's basically copying uh, variables every time you uh, call a function. Now that could significantly um, reduce your available memory, especially if you're working with large variables. And therefore you should be aware of that. Uh, there is a internal garbage collector. It's a special tool that uh, once in a while checks the memory and basically removes anything that's not useful anymore. But the problem is that because it's an interpreted language and R doesn't really know what kind of next command you're going to give it, um, it can't just remove a variable uh, out of memory. It only can do that when it's sure that this variable is not going to be used anymore. So overall, um, you can call a JC function, which is um, the garbage collector itself, but you usually don't get anything out of it, nothing significant. But it is still useful because um, you can actually see your current memory footprint. So I'm going to show you a little bit of code on the next slide, but right now I just want to bring your attention to a couple of functions available to you to kind of play with uh, variables in the memory. So first of all, of course, it's the GC function that allows you to view your uh, current memory footprint. Uh, additionally, you have a function called ls that is going to just list all the existing variables um, currently allocated in your memory. You have object size function that literally does what it's uh, named after. It will uh, give you the, the size of a variable. Uh, you can either specify the variable itself or you can use the get function to um, work with uh, variables as strings. This is of course useful when you combine these two functions like ls and object size together. And of course, once you realize that the variable is not needed anymore, of course, it's also makes sense to uh, do that when the variable is quite large. You can remove it uh, if it's no longer needed. So rm and the variable name will simply um, remove the variable from the memory. Now, on the very bottom of my slide, you can see there is a, a short um, example of a one line code that simply will print all the variables that are currently loaded in your workspace and it will sort it by its size. Uh, of course, make sure you are not in a fresh environment because then there is nothing to display. But uh, if you want to play with it, make sure to generate, to create you know, a couple of variables and then run this function. Uh, it's pretty useful if you want to see what's going on with your memory. So here I have an example of what GC command actually uh, displays. 
So you can see it shows the currently memory footprint where N cells and V cells are basically cells for numeric values and everything else uh, being V cells. Um, it's, it's an internal thing in our, um, they have a particular size like N cells are responsible for holding numeric values and uh, I think characters, slightly different um, size for uh, each uh, type. Um, so that's why you might have slightly different um, values to see uh, when you when you see that. And it also depends, of course, if you already created some kind of variables. So running GC on your computer will definitely produce a different result than you see here. Um, I decided to show you um, what it would take to create, for example, a variable in the memory. So I created a function just to take a snapshot of the current memory usage. Um, I use old mem as a variable to save my current state, current snapshot of the memory. Then I create a relatively large um, vector. It's actually two gigabytes. So be careful if your computer is a little bit short on memory. Um, X will hold a, a vector of two, a size of two gigabytes. You can see it right here, it's 2,048 megabytes. And then if I take the new snapshot and compare it with the old one, you can see that uh, the difference indeed is there. It's 2,000 gigabytes or uh, number of cells uh, is, is different number because you have to multiply it by eight. It's eight bytes to hold a numeric type. Um, Eventually, let's say I worked with this variable and I uh, now want to get rid of it because it's just too large. It's sitting there taking up my memory. Well, rmx is a way to get rid of it. Then if I take a snapshot again, you can see we're almost at uh, the same memory footprint that we had before, give or take some kind of internals that are uh, needed to generate in order to allocate the memory. So again, this is all useful only when you work with large variables. If you work uh, with smaller vectors, I, I guess on average, it doesn't really matter. But once you start loading huge uh, data sets, be aware of uh, copying it. Um, the, the R will copy it for you without you really knowing it. And therefore you might hit memory limits on the computer you're working on. The alternative, of course, is to use either machine with a larger, uh, memory footprint, like what we have on uh, our supercomputer Niagara. Uh, we have very large uh, memory available, or you can be more careful and delete everything that uh, is not needed anymore. Okay, any questions? Nope. Okay, so let's talk about another thing that is very, very useful. Um, especially it's useful if you're really not familiar with the code. So somebody, your colleague, you know, gives you a script and you have to take over the development of it and things are just slow. Uh, now they could be slow for a reason. You just, uh, maybe you're hitting the, the maximum or maybe because the script could be optimized. Uh, significantly optimized, and it really depends on the code, of course. So we will just give a, an overall overview of uh, how you can profile your code. Profile simply means to analyze your code and figure it out where the code spends the most of its time. Now, it's, uh, I guess the best advice I can give you is that you should only focus on optimizing parts where the code is spending most of its time. There is really no need to optimize this 10 millisecond uh, line, unless this 10 millisecond line is repeated 10 million times. And then of course it becomes uh, a major contributor of, for the overall uh, time of the script running. Okay, so um, it's also quite uh, interesting to compare uh, performance of different functions. Um, you can use a benchmark, benchmark benchmarking for it. Namely, there is a micro benchmark package available, or you can approximate it with a system time function that is going simply to time the um, how long it takes for code to run. 
Um, we will talk about that in a moment. Additionally, if you just have the whole, uh, the whole program for you, like somebody gave it to you and really do not know what's going on, then the R prof package could be uh, helpful to determine where the code is um, sitting most of its time. Let's start by talking about a very simple, a crude approximation for the running time is the system time command. It comes with R and it simply invokes the time command that's built in your uh, operating system. Here I have a simple example. I have a function. Um, it's literally nothing fancy. I just needed to waste some time. Uh, of course, it's up to you how long you want to run it. Think of it in your code. This is actually a very important function that does all the calculation, or at least a, um, a very important part of your calculation. Uh, and you want to measure how long it takes to run just this function. Well, system time, and then you just call your function. It will give you the output very similar to what you get in, uh, as an output of a time command in, in Linux. So you cannot have at least an approximation how long it takes for this particular function to run. Now, you, of course, you can compare this value um, with overall time, how long your script runs for, and then you can kind of estimate whether this function is worth your effort to optimize, or you can just keep it. Because if your code runs for 10 hours, honestly, a function that time runs maybe for 10 seconds might not be even worth your attention. You should be focused on something that uh, takes the majority of your runtime. Um, if you want to have more consistent results, um, you can use a micro benchmark package. This allows you to have uh, a better overview how your function performs. Uh, the, the function micro benchmark will give you a estimate of the statistical uh, values that will describe how well this function runs. It will give you minimum time it took for it to run, uh, median time, and so on. Now, the interesting thing is that it's going to run the function multiple times, and the number of times really depends how fast your function runs for. So overall, this function will try to not make you wait for too long, but you would still have to wait a little bit for it to finish. Uh, if your function runs extremely fast, maybe uh, this function will run it 100 times. If it's a slower function, then it might run it only 10 times. You have, of course, control of how long you want to uh, run uh, or how many times you want to run this function. So here I'm showing you how to run it, for example, for 10 times. It shows you that the, the time was measured in milliseconds. This will depend on uh, whether you have a very slow function or very uh, fast running function. And you can see that um, overall, it, it's quite consistent between the maximum and, and, million, uh, and uh, minimum value. So probably you should be looking at the mean or median value overall to kind of get an idea of how long your function is running. So we have a question uh, whether this slide would be available after the talk or not. We will definitely post it on our educational website. Um, Cyanad.courses will lead you to our educational website, and then you will just need to find the page for the colloquium. Search for the probably date or the word colloquium. It's quite unique. And then in this particular, on this page, you will find the slides. We haven't posted them yet, but we will put them there. Okay. Um, so I personally find micro benchmark to be useful in one particular scenario. So let's say you wrote a function. It was your first draft. It's running all right. But then you kind of thought of this function a little bit more. And you thought, you know, I can incorporate some optimization techniques, um, being it, you know, maybe using faster function or changing the logic a little bit. So I still get the same results, but I potentially get them faster. Well. In order to actually compare apples to apples, we can run micro benchmark on these two functions and see whether you're getting better performance or not. Here is a very trivial example uh, where I compare two functions. One is x to the power of uh, 0.5 and another one is uh, the square root of uh, x. 
the result is the same. However, if you look at the benchmarking, the SQRT function is significantly faster. Now, this kind of tips and tricks that I'm talking about, where you can replace things that look obvious initially with this little enhancements that overall would contribute to your uh, function running much faster. So uh, this is personally where I would use it most of the time because you can compare three, four, several functions and just choose which one gives you the best performance. Now, of course, if you're working with a large code, um, somebody gave it to you, right? And you really don't know what is so slow about this code, then you can um, use rprof. rprof comes with r, <clears throat> so you will have it by default. And here, I'm going to just show you an example how uh, you can use it. I created a simple function that doesn't do much. It's basically sleeping and returns the sum of two numbers. And then I have another function that's calling this function. So I'm kind of simulating a workflow where you have a couple of functions calling other functions and so on um, to just show you how it's going to be displayed using our bra. I turn it on by specifying a file name where I would like to store the information of this particular profiling. Then I run my function test. And once it's finished, I simply say rprof null, which turns off the profiling. This will generate a file called rprof.data. You can go look at it. But the easier way of working with it is through the function called summary rprof, where you just specify the file name and you get a nice data frame where you can investigate a little more of the performance. But what I find useful is to look at the by total uh, part of it, where it will give you an overall performance of your code. It will show you um, in by, by time and by the percentage, P PCT stands for percentage, uh, where your uh, code spends most of its time. So here you can see that overall uh, time was 238, but add me to 234. Uh, of it and the system slip to the most out of it. Now you can see here is dot, 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 because there are more actually internal functions being called uh, on your behalf, but I skip them because I can't really do anything uh, with them. They're called by R and they are literally take pretty much nothing. So of course here I'd be looking at the function that eats the most of my time. And here you can see self time and self percentage showing you that 97% was basically spent in system.slip. Well, of course, we <clears throat> created it that way, but in your situation, you would know which function uh, slows down your code. And now you can uh, attract, put your attention to uh, optimizing it. So here is just a short description of um, what I just said earlier. Another thing to note is that rprof will sample your program every 20 millisecond by default. You can change it, of course, but be aware that if you have some kind of code that runs faster than 20 millisecond, rprof might not be able to capture it. So just uh, keep that in mind. But if your code runs that fast, you probably don't even care about profiling at all. Okay, so um, any questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, let's uh, talk about other ways you can speed up your code. And this is, of course, uh, parallelization, right? You can make your code run on multiple cores. Now, be aware that there is some parallelization already built in R, and you potentially take advantage of it without really even knowing that. Um, the question is, could those be applied to Shiny apps to evaluate them? Uh, that's a good question. I personally did not work with uh, Shiny, heard of it. I would imagine that why not? Because as long as it's a function, you should be able to uh, test it. But I don't have an experience uh, specifically with that to, to answer this question. 
Um, so I guess as long as it's a function, yeah, you can benchmark it. And you can do profiling and so on. Okay, so um, let's say matrix, matrix multiplication will be done in parallel. Um, and uh, there is really no need to try to parallelize it even more because R will do a pretty good job on just uh, by itself. But sometimes it's not enough. You have some kind of custom code and uh, you don't want to, you, you can't take advantage of built-in parallelization. So you will have to parallelize it yourself. Uh, there are several ways to parallelize your code. There's a famous parallel library that comes with uh, uh, multi-core and snow style um, parallelization. But I'm going to talk about it because it requires you to modify your code to fit a particular style that this package um, wants you to have. Now, if you have, for example, some kind of a supply function that you're running, that could be very useful because you can just simply parallelize it from there. But most of the time, I personally see people sending us codes with a huge for loop and it just doesn't work. So what do you do? Uh, it's it's very, very common. People just put things into one big for loop, it's literally large, several um, dozens of commands. And they want it uh, run in parallel because you know maybe calculations are being independent on each iteration and they just want to aggregate things into a data frame. Uh, this is where for each and do parallel libraries become very, very helpful because they don't force you to change your code. You can stay with your for loop and you just have to uh, do minimal modifications to it. Uh, let's start by talking about, of course, a for, simple for a loop that you would have. Now, I have a very crude example, of course, and uh, you will have something more complicated than just uh, calculating a square root. But let's say, um, let's say we just, have this as an example. So I have a for loop and uh, I would like to parallelize it. Well, I first start by replacing the for loop with a for each um, function that comes with for each library. So you have to load it first. And then I replace my for loop with for each and then do. Now this code is still serial. This is important. It means that if your code runs serially and it was all fine, nothing is gonna change your code should still produce the same correct value. Moreover, the benefit of for each is that you can actually assign the result of the whole for loop for each loop to a variable that you can work with uh, later. So that's the difference between for and for each. So you confirm that your serial code, your serial for loop could be easily transferred to a for each for each format. The results are correct. And now you're ready to parallelize it. Well, how do you do that? Well, very simple, you load a library, do parallel, you register some kind of a backend. And here you have um, a choice. You can go with MPI, you can go with Snow or multi-core parallelism. But let's say you go with uh, register do parallel, which uses a multi-core style forking. And then all you have to do is replace your do in percentage sign to do par. That's it. That's all you have to do you will get the same result. Um, of course, now you have to hopefully compare that you're still getting um, correct answer, but hopefully you will get it much faster because now it will use the parallelization. Okay, uh, also keep in mind to stop the cluster at the end uh, of uh, your code. Now, the great benefit is that you can create a PSOC cluster. And uh, what's so good about PSOC cluster is that you can run your code across multiple computers, ac across multiple nodes, without really uh, dealing with MPI, which is, uh, I think, a very good uh, and simple way to parallelize your, or your code across multiple nodes. Uh, here, I, I'm not giving you an example how to parallelize across multiple nodes. Um, but it could be tweaked very easily where you would have to specify uh, basically the names of your nodes or IP addresses. So computer will know where to connect and where to launch them. 
So the difference is quite minimum. I create this piece of cluster. Uh, I specify that I want, for example, three processes. And then I register uh, do parallel with this cluster. That's pretty much it. It's just at the end, instead of stopping an implicit cluster, I have to stop a cluster. Is there a difference to multi-core versus multi-node? Multi um, so multi-core means you want to take advantage of all cores on your current machine. Now, on our supercomputer Niagara, each node, each computer has 40 cores. With the, if, if you account for hyper-threading that Intel processors have, you're talking about 80 cores, so you double the amount. But let's say you're talking about 40 cores, that's quite a lot. Sometimes this is just enough because on our you know, home uh, workstations, we might have maybe eight nowadays, maybe 16 cores, right? But when you work on larger supercomputers, you will have access to a large number of cores. So you don't always need to parallelize your code across multiple uh, nodes, across multiple computers. Now, if you don't have access to maybe uh, a supercomputer, but you have access to a couple of computers that maybe have four or eight cores, you can uh, create your own little cluster where you will just specify IP addresses and uh, you will calculate part of your uh, calculations on each of these computers. So that's the difference between multi-node where you uh, calculate across multiple computers or multi-core where you try to take advantage of all the cores on one computer. Does it answer your question, Brian? Sorry, so then do you need two nested for each is one to spread across the nodes and another one to spread across the cores at each node? You see, that's the interesting thing. With the piece of cluster, you can just simply specify a, a vector of host names and you can repeat the host name many times. So let's say I want to split my workload between two nodes and each node has 40 cores. Assuming, of course, I have enough work to do on all this you know, number of cores. So what I can do is I can create a vector by just replicating uh, values 40 times for, uh, it, will, it will have a host name one, let's say 40 times. And then I will say, I will have host name two another 40 times. In total, I have 80 um, host names and each host name would launch a different process. So you're actually going to be using all uh, computational power available on each node times two because you have two nodes. Uh, that's why I like piece of cluster. You don't have to do this hybrid approach where you have to like uh, launch one process on each node and then you have to make it like open MP style um, to use all the cores. No, you can just simply replicate the node multiple times and then it's gonna launch for you uh, a several separate process where it will do the calculations. Is that uh, kind of ring the bell? Yeah, yeah, that's that's much clearer, thanks. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, so um, if you are considering using multi-node, but right now you're still kind of working on one node, try using piece of cluster, just instead of specifying here three, you will have a set of host names that will just like 40 times the same node. Or in fact, if you're working on your own computer, I would just say 40 times, oh, sorry, <laughs> you may not have 40 cores, but let's say you have, four cores, you will just repeat local host four times. And that's it, that will give you a parallelization of it. Okay, so this uh, slide is more just about how to use forage uh, than a particular you know, trick to optimize something. You can combine results into one structure, being at a data frame or a vector. Uh, the interesting thing is that you can use multi-combine, which, uh, allows you to use a function that can take multiple arguments, like arbitrary number of arguments, which we call a variadic function. Uh, sum is one of them. And uh, if your function works with chunks of data, this could be uh, useful. But overall, usually people just want to like data frame at the end of their computation. You can use, for example, CBind for that. So overall, I personally recommend for each, if you have a big for loop, and you really have no time into reworking it into apply style, putting into different functions, you just wanted to parallelize it. That's where for each is very, very useful. Just replace for with for each and you're good to go. 
activate a particular backend, whether it be in a PSOC or implicit cluster, and then you can just continue from there. In my opinion, this is the best alternative to uh, launching like a full-blown MPI cluster. Uh, and uh, if you're working with R, I think that's a great alternative. Okay, um, of course, if you are after super performance, you wanna get the most of your code, then you need to kind of compile your code because compilation will um, look through the whole code, it will optimize it, um, it will know if the variable uh, disappears from the scope or not. So it will do a lot of optimizations for you and you will get pure machine code. Now, in R, you will get a, what's called a bike compiled code, which um, is like a, a middleware in between um, the machine instructions and your code. It's something in between which is, is, is very fast, but it's not particularly C code fast, but um, you're getting very close. So first of all, you need to identify which parts of your code are the slowest. Don't focus on something that is already fast enough. Uh, again, it's all relative to how long your code runs, right? Imagine your code runs for 24 hours. And are you going to spend uh, your day optimizing this 10 second function that's gonna make your code 10 second uh, faster? Most likely not, it's just not worth it. Now, if your code runs only for 30 seconds, then this 10 second um, computation su contributes significantly to overall uh, runtime of your code. And of course it's worth your time. Um, but again, it's not always worth going into learning another language and doing all these kind of tips and tricks to uh, optimize your code where you can simply run a couple of more times. It all depends how many times you uh, are going to run this code again. And if you basically want to get results fast, it's not always worth your time investment into restructuring your code and implementing all these advanced techniques. So um, there are ways to interact between pure C code or Fortran code with R, but it's not very easy. In fact, there is a package called RCPP that will allow you to kind of have everything in one window in your, in your R code, but it will require a little bit of a setup. But before you even go there, Probably I would say this would be the last resort to try to write parts of your code in, in C because the example I'm gonna give you is very trivial. Your code probably will use some kind of advanced uh, structures and heavy mathematical formulas and reworking them into the C code might be not as straightforward. So it's always good to see if the language can compile the code for you. And R actually does it for you. Quite a long time ago, you can see R version 3.4, the developers introduced a byte compiled um, loops. So basically loops are automatically compiled for you and functions are compiled on their first or second run. So the first run of the function could be quite slow, but if you're repeating it in a loop, for example, then the the second, third, fourth uh, run would be significantly faster. So let's look and compare how fast actually this, what's called just-in-time compiler is. So just-in-time compiler will take your code and convert it to some kind of intermediate code that is not yet the machine code, but it will run significantly faster than just interpreted code. Uh, there's a library called um, compiler that we're going to use. Uh, we also are going to compare um, the functions that, the, that are compiled and that are not, and I'm going to use my benchmark for that. That's exactly a good reason for it to be used. Now, what I'm going to do is, of course, not recommend it because I'm going to turn off the just-in-time compiler because I don't want this automatic byte compiling done for me because I want to compare, well, basically worst case scenario, yeah, yeah. Um, between uh, the, the performance between compiled code and uh, just without compilation. So I'm going to turn it off and I create some kind of 
um, silly function. It doesn't do much. It just calculates something, basically wastes time. But then I'm going to manually byte compile this function, uh, and I call this function ln. So notice that because I turned off the just-in-time compiler, f function will be run as you expected without any kind of compilation. It will be as slow as it gets. But lf, on the other hand, would be the compiled version of this function. When I run a micro benchmark and I compare these two functions, you can see that the difference is quite substantial. Namely, you're looking at 12 times difference. If you look at the, let's say, median value, the compiled function runs as like 1.3 millisecond versus 13.8. Now we're still talking about quite small um, run times because the function is a very, uh, it's like a toy example, right? But you can crank up the n value here to a you know, couple of order of magnitude. And uh, yeah, your function might run for a couple of seconds or maybe even uh, close to a minute. So you can test the, the difference between compiled version and uh, non-compiled version. So that's a good place to start. And I think uh, in most cases, that's where you probably will stop because you will get performance that's just good enough. You don't need to invest more of your time to get just a little bit more of the performance. Um, so overall, my suggestion would be to identify the parts of your code that are the most um, spending of your runtime of your code, your script. Uh, you can do this running profiling, uh, let's say rprof, and then you can simply byte compile this function to see if everything is going well. Because it's nice sometimes to just compare yourself that indeed code is compiled and maybe you're running your function only once, then you don't even get the benefit of byte compiling, right? So that's why uh, running manually CMP fun would potentially speed up your code by a lot. Okay, now let's say you tried it all and it's just not good enough for you. You want this raw performance, but yet you don't want a hassle of uh, having interface, you know, trying to interface two different languages together. Well, there is a package called RCPP that allows you to program in C, C++ straight in your R code and everything will be done for you. So it's pretty convenient. I think it's a, probably the best of world, both worlds. Uh, if you are using Linux or Mac, you should be fine because they come with uh, uh, compilers. But if you're on Windows, then you would need to um, install some kind of compiler and you also need to download our tools. So uh, it is quite large, I don't run it now, but this slide should just give you an overall idea if you go down this road, uh, what to do. Here I'm giving you a really a toy example of, of how, do you, how you use RCVP. So we have a question, is there a similar function to micro benchmark that tests the memory? required instead of speed? Well, um, when it comes to memory, as I mentioned earlier, you do have the GC function and you can just take uh, snapshots. Uh, when it comes to package, I personally didn't uh, dig into it that much. Um, but I think people in the chat say there are actually, there is a function. I'll give it a try. Um, I guess CPU performance is more something that I was into, but if you are a heavy memory user, then of course, try this bench mark. That could be useful. Thank you, Mary. I thought the R was built to avoid four use by the memory. Okay, that's that's a lot of questions here. And just give me a second. So, um, four is slow, but as you can see, for newer versions of R, it actually by compiled. So you should be all right. You shouldn't care that much. You're not particularly maybe getting the 
C++ speed, uh, speeds, but it's still fine. Um, you do get uh, advantage by using apply functions. And in fact, you can easily parallelize them by using um, the parallel package. Uh, you can simply replace the apply with the corresponding function from this package, and it's going to parallelize things for you automatically. So yes, it could be done very easily. You don't have to rewrite your, let's say, as apply to for loop just to take advantage of for each. I guess this is an example for those who already have a for loop, like a huge for loop, and they want to parallelize it, but they don't want to go to the apply family function and rewrite their code uh, in this particular way. Uh, <clears throat> um, okay, so Mary says that it only tests memory for sequential code. Okay, very nice. I guess uh, it could be a good package to look into. Thank you for the suggestion. Any other questions? Okay, so um, coming back to our CPP, here I'm giving you a very, very simple example that doesn't do really much. It just calculates a product of two numbers. But just to give you an overall idea how to use it, you simply create a string or a character um, type, what's called in R, but basically it's a string with your code. You put it into the CPP function argument and it will compile for you. Now, I simply get a function times, that's how I named it, available to me in R. So when I do that, you can see the result is the same. Now be aware that you're working with C code. You have to take care of the memory yourself. The big advantage of using RCPP is that it comes with R data types to help you kind of uh, facilitate this transition between C code and R code. Uh, for example, vector types, matrix types. And what's good about it, it comes with uh, an ability to deal with missing values like using an is and a function. Uh, so this is very helpful. And I think it's a good place um, to stop. And probably there is no need to go directly to uh, C. You can just write a very important part of your code using RCPP if everything else failed and you just want this performance um, from the C++ code. Okay. Um, yeah, Mary says that well-written R loops are actually faster than using apply function. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, Again, um, I think the development of the language is constantly um, progressing, right? And uh, that's where micro benchmarking could be helpful. Maybe you will have one function that uses S apply. Let's say you, you're you wondering, well, which one is better? Well, you have one function that you use S apply and another function with a for loop, right? So you just benchmark it and you see which one is better. Uh, personally, if this, this, the, the runtime is about the same. I would choose the one that's more easy to understand or uses less memory. But if you're getting a significantly better runtime for uh, a particular function, of course, it's best to use it. Okay. Um. Thank you guys for sharing this uh, nice links. I'm gonna go over them after the lecture. Now, there are a whole bunch of packages, of course, available that extend functionality. Um, today, we will be talking only what we are talking about, probably the most common, uh, commonly used and as close to the original built-in uh, functions in R 
uh, because things develop all the time. Uh, but if you keep uh, keep up with the development of R, of course, you can take advantage of some recent developments. Okay, so um, as just an overview, so what I think I want you to remember out of this presentation is that don't try to optimize beforehand. Finish your code first. Make sure everything is running correctly. You're getting the result. And if you feel that it's running way too slow, you can identify points in your code where you can actually benefit from optimizing this particular part. You can parallelize it, for example. That's probably one of the ways to take advantage of your powerful machine. Or you can byte compile, or you can do both. Um, RCVP is not that scary. It's just that um, it requires you to be careful in another language. R does a lot of things for you. It's very convenient. I think that's why we love it. It also assumes a lot of things for you. And if you're not aware of it, like for example, is for loop faster than apply. Um, so a lot of things are assumed. Uh, in C, on the other hand, you have to take care of a lot of things yourself. So if you're using RCPP, be aware of it, but the syntax will be very similar to what you already know in R, just slightly a different format of it. And uh, I guess the, the main point that I want to make is that you can always email us if you have any questions. We will try our best to apply our knowledge to help you improve your code. We do this all the time. Uh, we have quite a lot of people using R on our supercomputers. And um, they just come to us saying, you know what, I have this code I did for each uh, due parallel, but I don't get the right result or I want to put it in a different format. So we try to assist people as much as we can. Um, so this pretty much summarizes the uh, today's session.